The last time we stopped at verse 3.3, that was actually a very good place to stop. And so just to briefly recap the first three verses of chapter three are extremely important. They talk about dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. Just to recap briefly, dharana is when we are trying to concentrate on an object. So for example, during meditation, if your object of concentration is the breath, you're trying to keep your attention focused on the breath, perhaps at the space which is between the two nostrils, called nasagre, and you find that your mind is continuously wandering and disturbed by thoughts, by images, memories, fears, maybe desires. But with a little bit more effort and time, you notice that your attention is now more focused and you can stay with the object of concentration for a slightly longer period of time. The attention or the awareness seems to flow. This is called dhyana. As the attention keeps flowing continuously and steadily towards that object of concentration, we have taken example of the breath, so you keep on keeping your awareness with the breath, and suddenly you notice that the entire mind is absorbed in the breath. And it seems suddenly the mind and pure consciousness that separate and pure consciousness witnesses the mind. So this is Samadhi. We discussed that the last time in greater detail using the diagram. Now verse 4 says, when the three, dharana, dhyana and samadhi, take place on the same object, the process is known as samyam. So what I just described to you is samyama. So it is a continuous process which takes place in one flow. And this flow is called samyama. It's a complete absorption in that object. Samyama is very important to understand because if you want to achieve deeper meditation, what you need to do is to understand and learn Samyama. What generally happens is that when people start meditation, they say that they are sitting quietly. What happens generally is that the mind is wandering around. That's not meditation, not as defined by the Yoga Sutras. That is dharna. The mind is still wandering, is disturbed continuously, and you cannot really focus the mind. Another mistake that is made by beginners is they think, oh, I'm being disturbed by thoughts, therefore I should try not to think about anything. And what happens then is complete suppression. It's not that your thoughts go away anywhere. You have just buried them deeper in the unconscious mind or the other two levels of consciousness. That is dreaming and deep sleep. So we see that the process of 
understanding and mastering Sanama requires a great deal of practice and preferably also guidance. There are many pitfalls. One of them I mentioned that many beginners start suppressing their thoughts and the result is not very healthy because this is not a very therapeutic thing to do. So this idea of Samyama, this process requires a degree of mastery. It implies that you need to be able to do this at will and it requires willpower, sankalp, and very important, it requires a purified and one-pointed mind. If the mind is not purified, these thoughts will continuously disturb you and there you are down back to dharana again. So first you need to purify and then you come to actual process of meditation or an object of concentration. The word samyama comes from sama is complete and ayama is control. Samyama means complete control. That's a certain degree of mastery which is required for this. As we proceed now into the next verses of chapter 3, I would like to caution you that it gets a little bit more difficult and maybe also a little bit more incredible because we are now going to learn more about the supernormal powers. So there are many things that may sound quite incredible to you. but. I will explain them as we go along. Verse 3.5. Before we go to verse 3.5, I will stop to take questions if there are any about this process of Samyama. Today we have Rafael and Lucia joining us from Peru. They made it this time. Nice to have you join us, Rafael and Lucia. <coughs> yeah, that's nice. Wonderful to be here. Wonderful to have you. So it seems that Samyama is clear. So verse 3.5, we now talk about By mastering Samyama, the light of consciousness shines forth. As I just mentioned in the previous verse, that certain separation takes place in Samadhi and when that happens, the mind starts the mind itself is an object. So we go to our favorite diagram, at least my favorite diagram. And we see that when Samadhi is experienced, it is as though something cut here this, at this point where the center of consciousness separates from the body, conscious mind and unconscious mind and the center of consciousness or pure consciousness looks upon all of this as though it were separate. It was, it's an object now. The mind itself has become an object. When this happens, 
it seems as though there's a paradox here. Someone asks the question, who am I? Because suddenly there's a realization, I am looking at the mind itself. I'm looking and observing and witnessing my thoughts. So if I'm not the mind, then who am I? So this question, who am I, suddenly arises there when this happens for the very first time. This separation takes place for the very first time. I have mentioned this before, that when that separation takes place, it's what's called Viyog. And when this may happen, it may be very brief. You may not be able to sustain it. Suddenly, the conscious mind, the active and latent unconscious mind become very, very active again. And the separation is lost. And so you are back into the mind and left only with a kind of an impression or a memory of what had happened. That moment when you were witnessing your own mind and you asked the question, who am I? When that experience was powerful enough, strong enough, intense enough, you will never forget it. And if it is not strong and intense, it's very mild, then it's possible that you just forget it. And those are called fleeting samadhis. And we experience these off and on through our daily life. If you go for a walk and it's very calm, beautiful morning, and the sun is rising and you watch the sun and suddenly something shifts in you and you realize, oh, I am watching, I'm, an, I'm a witness. But maybe that moment was not strong enough, intense enough, and you forget about it. But when you do it consciously or if the experience is intense enough, you will not forget it. And you will long for that to return. This question will not leave you. Who am I? And longing becomes stronger. And this is the knowledge, the state of a witness, <clears throat> which must get stronger and firmer in the mind. When that happens, it will be easier to gain mastery in Samyama because you have already seen it once. So yes, this requires a great deal of uh, proficiency in practice and uh, at the same time it is uh, also a great achievement. Okay, we can go back to our document. Are there any questions about this? This is this was verse three point five by mastering prana by mastering samyama. The light of consciousness shines forth. <clears throat> Verse 3.6, Samima is to be mastered systematically in a step-by-step -step process. I mentioned to you about fleeting samadhis and I said, yes, it can happen. That is grace, kripa. It happened and you had an insight. But how do you get there again? you may find that these moments of grace don't come very often. You can keep trying to go for a walk every morning and watch the sunrise, but then the more you try <laughs> to experience it again, it just does not happen. So what do you do? There's a systematic process. 
from the external to the internal, from gross to subtle. And we have been talking about that since the time we started the Yoga Sutras. Those of you who have been joining the online meetings earlier, we talked about it when we did Master and Pranayam. And uh, in fact, in all our meetings, we have always talked about this systematic process from gross to subtle. So we can go back to our diagram and just for those of you who may not be aware of it, the process goes from, this, from the world, worldly objects from the senses to the body. Gaining body awareness is also important. Awareness of the breath, conscious mind, understanding and knowing the unconscious mind, purifying, and then finally coming to the subtle most center of consciousness. It's a systematic process. Some people try to skip stages and they think that if they are doing some asanas here at the body level, that somehow, miraculously, they are going to get here to the center of consciousness. That's not going to happen because there's breath, there's a conscious mind, and then there is the deep unconscious mind right there in between. Even if you do some sort of meditation, you do get to know a little bit about the unconscious mind. You cannot jump from the conscious mind directly to the center of consciousness. We have to deal somehow with this very difficult territory of the unconscious mind if you are seriously interested in attaining self-realization. For many per people, this is very difficult. This, this is called the tantric part of sadhana. And while the Vedic aspect is of leading a, a healthy lifestyle out in the world, it's very useful. Maintaining purity, cleanliness of the body, having a healthy body is very important. Doing breathing exercises, doing some sort of meditation, understanding pranayama, understanding that pranayama is different from breathing. All this you can do. And most people are able to do this but they have a very hard time with the unconscious mind. It's a big barrier, it's a big obstacle. And since very few people do manage to purify and learn to navigate through these very difficult waters of the unconscious mind, they are not quite able to get here. So they get stuck somewhere here. That's where they most of the meditators get stuck. So the Yoga Sutras say, you cannot skip the stages. You have to go through that systematic process from external to internal, from gross to subtle, in a step-by-step -step manner. In my book, pra Mastering Pranayama, I have also explained this idea of gently transitioning, moving from one stage to the other. In tradition, in the oral tradition, we use the example of the North Star. For those of you who have looked at the night sky and tried to find the North Star, or the polar star as it's called, you know it's very difficult to find it. It's very small, it's very subtle, it's not very bright. So to find the polar star directly is very difficult. First, you need to find the plow or the bear. It is 
very bright constellation and it's very easy to spot. And when you find the great bear or the plow, you can very easily find the North Star. What is the purpose of this example? It's the fact that we go from the gross to subtle. You cannot find the subtle directly. You need to go through the gross to find the subtle. And so also, we cannot jump directly from the body to the subtle most of your consciousness. We cannot jump from the conscious mind to the pure consciousness. We need to go through that process systematically. Any questions regarding verse three point six. Okay, all good. Then we come to verses 7 and 8. <clears throat> Verse 7 says, These three, that is Dharma, Dhyana and Samadhi, are internal or subtler than the external limbs. You remember the eight limbs. We started with the Yamas, Niyamas, Asan, Prayan, Pranayam, Pratyahar, Dharna, Dhyana and Samadhi. So the last three are considered to be more internal or subtler than the first five. Well, we, we see that this deals now with the, the finer, the subtler aspect of the mind and even consciousness. Therefore, it is considered internal or subtler. The word internal and external can sometimes be a little bit confusing and therefore people think um, that uh, somehow these are two parts and we, we don't need to do the internal part and we should just focus on the external and that's why a lot of people end up getting stuck with asanas thinking that external means physical body, but what is meant is the word gross. We're talking about philosophy, a life philosophy or approach to life when we speak about yamas and niyamas. We're talking about physical health, culture, not in the sense of physical culture like people who get into a body cult kind of thing. Talking about the breath, all this is external or more gross, while the internal is extremely subtle, talking about the internal world of the mind. So in comparison to this, even the yamas, niyamas, all, all of this appears to be very gross. Any questions about that? If you would read most commentaries or translations, um, you probably wouldn't understand even the first line there. So I have made some effort to make the language easy. While the language may be easy, some of the ideas or concepts may be a little bit complex. And that has to do with, of course, with experience, that those who have deeper meditation will begin to get insights and understand some of these ideas. Which is why we always say, say in our tradition, 
You don't need to study the Yoga Sutras. What you actually need to do is study the mind. When you study the mind, you will, you will understand the Yoga Sutras. So verse 8 of chapter 3 says, However, these three, Dharna, Dhyana, and Samadhi, are with object. So we have taken the example of the breath. So you're doing Dharna, Dhyana, and Samadhi. And the object is breath, or the object may be a mantra, or a certain focal point in the body, whichever one. Dharna, Dhyana, Samadhi, or Samyama, with object is external or gross. Even that is gross compared to nirbij samadhi, objectless samadhi. So now we go to still another level of meditation, a still higher level than samyama. Because in samyama, you had an object. We took the example of the breath. But now, in nirbij or objectless samadhi, even the object drops away. To give you an example, experience of extreme joy. It may be the first time you fell in love, the birth of your child, or you had some great success in job or education, the day you got your degree. There is extreme joy, and the joy was because of a reason. But now imagine that the reason drops away, but the joy remains. That would be objectless samadhi. Reasonless joy. So we see that from samadhi and samyama, we have now gone to objectless samadhi. It's getting finer, it's getting subtler. And it gets still subtler. Now there are the three transitions. As thoughts, verse 9, as thoughts, mental images, Emotions and desires subside. The impressions of tranquility and stillness arise in the mind. This transition towards a tranquil and still mind is known as Nirod Parina. So you notice that the mind is transitioning slowly from a very distracted state towards a tranquil state during meditation. If you're able to witness that and observe that, then what you're observing is a transition known as Nirodha Parinam. Parinams are transitions. It is a similar experience, similar to hunger. You may see that hunger rises and you eat something, you're satisfied for, for a while, and then hunger rises again. So similarly, when you watch this transition here, happening where thoughts and images, emotions subside, and at the same time, when these emotions subside, tranquility rises, stillness rises. And this, when you can hold this, Transition when you're observing this transition it is a called Nirod Parinam. So now you're learning to observe your mind. That's what you're doing. You're observing your mind and how it functions. Verse 10 says. The impressions of the tranquil and still mind are strengthened when the state repeats itself. And that's what we want to do. We want that this state of tranquility keeps repeating itself. 
But every time it's repeated, it's strengthened in the mind. These are some skaras which are developing. Just as you develop some skaras when you get angry and you're strengthening the samskaras of anger, similarly, when you experience tranquility repeatedly, these samskaras are strengthened in the mind. You're creating new samskaras. Verse 11, the mind withdraws from many different objects to attend to a single object and becomes one-pointed. So the verse says, Samadhi Paranam is the transition when the impressions of many-pointedness subside and the impressions of one-pointedness arise. So the mind may be internally focused but even internally, it may be with many different thoughts, many different images, objects. And when the mind has been trained to leave the many and start focusing on the one, that is Samadhi Parinam. In my book, Mastering Pranayama, this is explained in the second part which is the, the advanced part on pranayama itself, how we use practices like Nadi Shodhanam to acquire a one-pointed mind. So in the first one, we talked about impressions of tranquility, that was Nirod Parinam. In the second transition, we're talking about moving from one pointedness, sorry, from many pointedness to one pointedness. So now the third transition, the third and the last transition in verse 12. When the one and same object arises, subsides and arises in the mind repeatedly. This is called a kakrata parinam. So let's take the example of the breath. And you're with the breath, it subsides, and the breath arises again, and it subsides, and it arises again. And you're with the breath all the time, you're not aware of anything else. That is a kakrata parinam. So these are three technical observations, I would say. They are observing the mind and the subtler aspects of the mind. So you're not just observing the object itself. But you're actually observing how the mind is moving from, from a very distracted mind to a still mind, from a many-pointed mind to a one-pointed mind, and the mind that observes the same object again and again. And this is a much subtler and finer uh, observation power than even than the earlier ones. So as we are diving deeper into the Yoga Sutras, verse 13 says, as the mind transitions through these three parinams, the different qualities of the object of concentration, the subjectivity of time, the changing qualities of the five elements, and the ten indriyas are revealed. So this is a difficult verse. So now you are even observing the transitions and you notice the, that the object has different qualities. You begin to grasp the essence of that object. You 
you notice that time itself is subjective. The mind gets so absorbed in this observing itself, you can say, that you begin to realize that time is not constant. Most of, the, most of us believe that time is somehow constant and uh, that you have perhaps observed that when you are very interested in a subject, time flies. But if you are bored or you're waiting somewhere for somebody, the time seems to pass so slowly. So time is subjective. That the elements are all continuously changing. If you take any object, let's take the human body. The human body is subject to change. It is made up of the five elements. And you were a child, you became a teenager, an adult, grown up, uh, and now you're aging. And you notice that it's always changing. The elements keep changing. It's not going to remain constant. You also notice that the senses, the active and cognitive senses, are also changing. Even these are not constant. So the instruments with which we study the world, even these are not very reliable. So as you begin to observe the mind itself, you begin to see that everything is transient, changing and subjective. Through our normal education and upbringing, Many of us have the idea that things are fixed. You know, that's, that's the maya. That's when we fall into this trap. That things are somehow going to remain the way they are. And we don't like it when there's big changes in our life. But these big changes, these times of transition are very important in our life. So when the child changes into a teenager, can be for a very difficult time for parents, can be also a very difficult time for the, for the child itself. Or when you transition from the scarefree youth into an adult that has to go to work, also a very difficult transition. So these transition periods are hard, but they're very necessary and important for our development. In these transition moments, we begin to realize that everything is constantly changing. We cannot hold it. We cannot fix it rigidly. However much we try, it's not possible to do that. Any questions, thoughts, or comments about the transition? So verse 14 clarifies that a little bit further when it says, the result of studying the mind and its transitions is recognizing its changing nature. The manifested past, the manifest present, and the unmanifested qualities or impressions of the mind play out on an underlying reality that remains constant. So in meditation you've been studying that the mind is constantly changing. We can use our diagram once again for this and we see that the past has already manifested. It's over. It's done. The present is happening now. That is manifest right now. But the unmanifest qualities, they are still to come. Where is all this playing out? 
This is all playing out on an underlying reality that always remains constant. You know it's a fact that when you were a little child, you were really small, you were an infant, there was a certain quality that you had, and I can take my own example. I was Radhika when I was two years old. There was something in me, and that was Radhika. When I grew a little bit older, became a child, I had different interests. I was, you know, not absorbed in myself, but I wanted to have friends and playmates, and we played with different things. And uh, still, there was something in me that was Radhika. And as the body grew, matured, became a teenager, had different interests, completely different. The mind changed, the personality was different, the body looked different, but still there was something there, and that was Radhika. Then I grew up, became an adult. Now again, my interest personality transformed. The body looked more mature, I looked older. Still, there was something, and that was Radhika. And as I grow older and age, the body will really start aging. My ideas may change again. The way I see the world might change again. And still, there will be something that is Radhika. That constant reality, that that is pure consciousness. And all these things that play out here in the world, they play out in this because of this underlying reality that remains constant. If even this would change, then it's like having no center. So that's not possible. There is something that is constant. So everything in the external world keeps changing, but something remains constant. And that something is pure consciousness. Any thoughts, comments about this? Verse 15 says, this natural law of change is the cause of the transitory world. So we understand from this, there are two aspects of reality. One is the ever-changing transitory reality of the external world and the internal mind, so to say, which is also continuously changing. And then there is a permanent, constant reality that's pure consciousness. We can see it much better in our diagram that everything that is this side here, all this here, is changing. The, the world outside, the senses, the body, mind, active and later unconscious, everything is changing. The only thing which remains constant is here. This is the only constant. So verse 16 says, one who has mastered Samyama on the three transitions of Nirodha, Samadhi and Ekagata Parinam derives knowledge of the past, present and future. So now we are talking about Samyama on the transitions. 
transitions we've observed in the mind, and now we are so fine. The observation, the witnessing, can you even able to perform some amount of the transitions themselves? And with that, you will know the past, present, and future. You might think, oh, I already know the past. Why do I need to do some amount? That's not true. You do not know the past because once you start meditation, you get to know a lot about your past samskaras. These samskaras, it's memory, remembrance and memories. And these may not be limited to your present life, but also to past lives. So, with this Samyama, the mind itself, you begin to get self-knowledge, get to know yourself. And these ancient memories, they arise, samskaras. Knowing the present is also not very obvious. Most of us think we are in the present, but most of the time, our minds are distracted and we are not really paying attention to the present. When you are in the present, really here and now, you get something like a, a shock. In that moment when you suddenly arrive in the world, that kind of attention is what is being talked about here. It's not this kind of distracted uh, being here that is being talked about. What about the future? To give you an example, if I take a glass and I let go of it, I'm holding a glass and I let go of it, I know, I know it's gonna fall and break. How do I know that? Do I know the future? Well, that's obvious, right? That if I drop a glass, it will break. When you have very fine observation powers, very subtle, you can see many steps ahead of any action. And not only of one action, but actions in, in different, with different alternatives. For example, a woman can choose if she has to choose from three different professions, let's say that she could be a, decide to be a social worker, she would be a corporate lawyer, or a beautician. Now, these are three completely different kind of professions. You can tell, more or less, that she's going to have a very different life if she's going to be a corporate lawyer from a life of a social worker. So you can then imagine how, how many steps ahead can you think and say, wow, you know, this is going to be so different, such different choices. Or if you have a man who maybe has <laughs> the, the choice of, you know, asking one woman to marry him or asking another, and depending on the woman, his life, entire life would be different. So these are choices we make, and depending on our choice, our entire future plays out differently. So someone who has a very sharp sense of awareness can see different alternatives and can can see that many, many steps ahead. So one whose mind has mastered Samyama on the three transitions itself can derive all this knowledge from the past, present, as well as future. Does that make any sense?
we are slowly now coming into the aspects of the supernormal powers. These are the Siddhis. And uh, there are many of these. And so the next session also would be perhaps covering some of these Siddhis. And sometimes they sound unbelievable, but at other times it makes sense. If you read the general commentaries, uh, you, you will not even understand anything because uh, they're written in such uh, academic language that none of it makes any sense whatsoever. Thank you, Lucia and Raphael. Thank you very much. I'm glad you like the explanation and the translation. So now we come to Samyama on words and sound. So you see that now, from now onwards, we're going to keep talking about Samyama. Samyama, to remind you briefly, is dharana, dhyana, and samadhi in a flowing, in a one continuous motion or a flow on a certain object or an idea. And uh, so... I have to mute you, Darren, since there was some noise there, background. I think you've been having some problem with connectivity, Darren. Eh? Sorry about that. So verse 17 actually is, is the basis of Mantra Vidya, and it is also a deeper understanding of language. So the verse says, the word, its meaning and the idea that it represents are mixed together. If samyama is practiced on the word, the object indicated by the word and its idea to distinguish between them, then the meaning of all sounds produced by all beings can be acquired. And this sounds quite incredible. If you take an object, mother, mother is a nice object, and it could be your own mother, or it could be mother as in many religious traditions, you will have worship of the mother, in Christianity, you have Jesus as a baby with Mother Mary. And in the uh, traditions from India, we have often the uh, tradition of the Divine Mother. So if you take your own mother or one of these symbols, the word mother is connected to the object, which could be physical mother or the symbol mother, and there's a sound, mother itself, that, that is the sound. So we have three parts here. You have the object, you have the, the word or sound, and we have the symbol or the emotions that go with it. So what are the kind of emotions that arise when we think of mother? Maybe unconditional love, depending on your relationship with the mother different and strong emotions would arise. Most of the time, these are mixed together, the three of them. You're not able to distinguish between the three. They are so much together. But when we begin to understand that the three are different, then we are beginning to understand about the basis of language, how a language is constructed. And this is why when we are able to do that, you are able to understand meanings of sounds produced by all beings. And this is also the basis of mantra vidya, sound and the power of sound. 
And certain mantras, they don't necessarily have any real meaning in the sense that they are not indicating a certain object. So you could say they are more or less meaningless, but they have a connection to certain symbols or emotions. And you acquire certain qualities from this. So mantra vidya, understanding the letters and the sounds, give us greater and deeper understanding into this esoteric science. So we have similarly in the following sessions, we will do Samyama on mental impressions, that's on the samskaras, Samyama on the tan, 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 tan mantras, on karma, on the various qualities, and so on and so forth, on the different chakras and focal points. So you see, all of these are points of objects of concentration. And you may have sensed a pattern now that by concentrating on certain objects, you acquire certain siddhis or powers. But first of all, you need to acquire that kind of ability to concentrate. You cannot concentrate if your mind is continuously being disturbed. If the mind is not one-pointed, if it is multi-pointed, or there is a lot of stuff, memories, etc., which keep coming up, then there is no tranquility. So without purification and resolution of internal conflicts, you will not get a one-pointed mind. And without a one-pointed mind, it is not possible to master the process of Samyama. So we see that while we are doing the Siddhis, it's important to remember that we cannot skip the stages. We cannot skip the foundation. It includes healthy lifestyle. It includes all the practices that one does, even at the physical level, at the breath, at the level of simple meditation and training of the mind to purify it. Maybe this is a good place to stop and we can continue next time with some more mental impressions. Okay, so it was nice to have you all. Thank you, Perry. Thank you very much. We have a great weekend too. Thank you, Jayan. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. So, bye bye, Debbie. Bye, Jayan. Bye, Lucia and Raphael. Bye, Balaji, Manisha. Bye bye, everyone.